Isn't it a great day to be a Christian? Turn your Bibles to the 28th Psalm. Psalm number 28 will be our scripture for this evening's lesson. Last Sunday morning, and again, again this morning, we talked about prayer. We talked about praying to God. And tonight we're going to see if there are any attitudes that we might have that would keep us from having good reception to those prayers. So let's read in Psalm 28, starting in verse 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors, Give them after the work of their hands, render to them their desert. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield, my heart trusted in him. I am helped, therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also, and lift them up forever. I mentioned the name Charlie Brown, or Lucy, or Schroeder, or Snoopy. You know I'm talking about the cartoon strip Peanuts. And the illustrator of Peanuts, the one that created that cartoon, was a man named Charles Schultz. Now, Charles Schultz was somewhat of a theologian. He tried to put his understanding of God uh, into his cartoon. And a lot of times when you'll read some of those cartoon strips, you'll see him talking about uh, the way that he felt that God interacted with mankind. And that uh, carried over to his family. One day, his younger daughter, Jill, uh, came up to him and said, Daddy, when I pray, if I hold my hands upside down like this, I get just exactly the opposite of what I asked for. Now, I don't know how she came up with that, but sometimes people pick up, especially kids pick up on different characteristics, on different things, and she knew that there was a form. She knew how she was supposed to pray, and so she thought if you did the opposite of that, that you get the opposite of what you asked for. Now, we don't think things like that, but sometimes I believe that we think that our position affects our prayer. How we speak, how we hold our hands, how we stand or kneel or whatever has something to do with the way our prayers are received. Uh, when we lived in Memphis, in the early days of our marriage, we had this little television and it had rabbit ears on top. And I don't know if you had TVs with rabbit ears, but you'd extend them and you'd turn them and you'd try to get the best reception you can. Sometimes we would attach coat hangers or we'd put aluminum foil on it. Sometimes we find out if you're holding on to the antenna, it makes it work better. And the joke got to be, okay, now raise your left hand when you hold on to the antenna. Now stand on one foot, lean your head just a little bit to one direction, see if you can get better reception. And that was a joke, but sometimes people think that the way that they position themselves will have something to do with the reception of their prayers. Some think that they'll be able to pray better if they're kneeling or if they're holding up their hands or if they're laying prostrate on the ground. And all of those are examples that are in the Bible of how people were standing or kneeling or sitting when they were praying. But I don't think that our position has anything to do with the reception of our prayers as much as the position of our mind. What are we thinking? How are we thinking when we're praying? So tonight I want us to talk about three things that I believe that the Bible says will interfere with our prayers if we're not having the right train of thought, if we're not thinking right. that will cause bad reception when we pray to God. The first kind of wrong thinking is not being earnest in our prayers. Do you know of anybody that prays kind of lackadaisically? Uh, they're praying, but they don't sound like their heart's really in it. Or maybe they're not doing a public prayer and you wonder. They don't have very much intensity when they pray. Charles Spurgeon once wrote this. He said, prayer pulls the rope down below and the great bell rings above in the ears of God. 
Some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray so languidly. Others give only an occasional jerk at the rope. But he who communicates with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly and pulls continuously with all his might. Now, I don't know that heaven is really, the prayer is really a bell ringing in heaven, but I do understand that if you want to make some noise, you need to really pull on the rope when you're ringing a bell. And this theologian used that same thought with prayer. We need to pray like we really mean it. Teacher once asked his classroom if they believed in prayers, and all of them spoke up and said, of course, sure we do. And then he asked, well, why don't you pray more often? And then they started coming up with excuses. Well, I don't have enough time. I'm too busy. Uh, I think maybe God's too busy. Uh, some said, I don't know what to say. A few said, I don't feel worthy of prayer. These were folks that believed in prayer, but they weren't doing it. They didn't want to spend the effort. Now let's contrast that with David's prayer in Psalm 28. Psalm 28, 1, David prayed, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. David was praying like he knew what was at stake. He was crying to the Lord because he knew if the Lord didn't answer his prayer, he was lost. He was just like everybody else. If God wasn't involved, if God wasn't active in his life, David wasn't putting on a show. David wasn't faking this. He was sincere in his heart. He was earnest in his prayers. And I think that the first position of our minds that could cause our prayers not to be received well is if we're not earnest. Second kind of wrong thinking is praying for our will instead of God's will. James chapter 4, verse 3. James wrote, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Why did James say they didn't get what they asked for? Because they were praying for the wrong motives. They were praying for what they wanted instead of for what God wanted. A lot of people think that way. They think, well, God loves me. God wants me to be happy, so he wants to give me what I want. The way I want it, when I want it, and I want it right now. And they spend time praying like that. Uh, I like kids. I've been around kids most of my adult life. And if I were to go out with a bunch of kids to a party or something, we're in a restaurant, say, celebrating something, and there's an arcade, and one of them comes up and asks me for a quarter, if I've got a quarter, I'll give it to them so they can go play in the machines or whatever. But let's say I give away all my quarters and somebody comes up and, and asks for one. And I tell this little boy, I said, well, I'll give you one. Let me pay my check first. And if I have any change left, I'll give you a quarter. And he said, no, I want a quarter now. I said, well, not right now. Be patient. Wait just a minute. He said, I want it now. And then he starts putting his hands in my pocket and trying to see if I've got any money, if I'm holding out on it. Well, if somebody's like that, even though I like this kid, I'm probably not going to give him a quarter because he's not asking the right way. He's not approaching things in the right way. And James said, if we don't approach God in the right way, he's probably not going to answer our prayers. Even if he likes me, even if he wants to do something for me, I need to make sure that I'm asking in the right way. The wrong attitude is asking God for what we want to be done instead of for what he wants to be done. And smart prayers don't do it that way. Smart prayers listen to the advice of Apostle John in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, when he wrote this. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Remember, Jesus was our greatest example of prayer. And when he prayed, it was not my will, but thine be done. We need to make sure that the things we're asking God to do are things that he will want to do. Well, how do we know that we can pray something that God wants to do? Well, that's how David prayed in Psalm 28. Look at verse two. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. He was saying, I don't deserve this. I'm looking for mercy. I'm crying to you. Help me here. Look at verse five. He wants God to deal with his enemies because they regard not the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands. In other words, he's saying, deal with my enemies because I respect your word. I want to do what you want me to do, 
But they don't. These people don't love you. You need to punish them because they don't follow you. And then verses 8 and 9, he puts it all together. He says, the Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Who was God's anointed? David was God's anointed. He says, save thy people. Well, who was God's people? David was God's people. And he's saying, I am blessed thine inheritance. Who was, David, who, was God's in, who was God's inheritance? David was God's inheritance. And he said, feed them also, lift them up forever. God's promised to take care of his anointed, to take care of his people, to take care of his inheritance. And David was just praying that God would do what God had already said that he was going to do. So in just those three short verses, David sums everything up. How God would, or why God would want to answer his prayer because he was asking in humility, he was asking for mercy. He's saying that I respect you unlike my enemies that are persecuting me. And he was saying, I'm one of your people. You promised to help me and I need some help right now. Throughout the Bible, we read of prayers that were offered and over and over they tell why God would want to answer their prayers. And a lot of times it was because of a promise that God had made. And here's something we can be sure of. If God makes us a promise, then that is his will. That's what he wants to do for us. That's why a lot of parents, when somebody asks them for something, the kid will come up and say, can we have some ice cream? And they'll say something like, well, I'll think about it, but I'm not going to make any promises. <laughs> why are they not making any promises? Because if they say, I promise then that kid's going to hound them from then on till they get the ice cream because they know that when you promise something, that that's your will. That's what you want to do, and you're going to do that. And so they're going to keep asking till they get it. If God's made a promise to us, he intends to keep it. And a promise is a record of his will. So when we pray something based on God's promises, we know that we're praying according to his will. So how can we know what his promises are? Well, he's recorded them for us. His will is recorded in this book. So if we read it and study it and apply it and do it, then we'll know that our prayers are based on God's will. So the first two ways or wrong ways of thinking that can interfere our prayers are not being earnest and then praying for something that's not according to God's will. The third kind of wrong thinking that can affect our prayer life is praying without believing. Look at Psalm 28 again, starting verse six. Blessed be the Lord because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him. I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. Now, English is a weird language. I don't know if you remember studying English tenses when you were in school. I read the other day that there are 36 different English tenses. I can remember past and present and future and past perfect, present perfect, future perfect, and maybe a few more. In Hebrew that David was writing in, there are two tenses. Two tenses, complete and incomplete. Or they're called decided and undecided. Everything either is going to happen or it's not going to happen. That's the only two outcomes and when David's praying this prayer, he's praying it in the completed sense. He's praying it in the decided tense. He knows that God's already decided he's going to do what David's asking because he's praying according to God's will. He has heard, I am helped. David's praying that he knows that God is going to give him what he is asking because God loves him. He's asking according to God's will. He's asking earnestly. And he knows the outcome's already been decided. David prays this way because he knows he's seen God do it before. He knows that God has always answered his prayer when he's praying according to his will. And James tells us that that's a critical element in prayer. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him but... Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed, for let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable 
in all his ways. When I pray, I've got to believe in God's faithfulness. I've got to believe that God will keep his promises, that he'll do what he said he'll do. But if I doubt, then James says I'm unstable. And people don't want to do things for unstable people. Think about it. If you had a son or a grandchild or somebody that, that needed some money, they came up and they asked you for $5,000 and you had it, uh, you'd probably be willing to give it to them if you thought that they were stable, that they would do what they needed to do with it. But if they hadn't been faithful in the way they'd used their money before, you might have second thoughts about giving it to them. Uh, and James said we can't approach God and be all wishy-washy. We can't be being washed back and forth like the waves of the sea. He said when that happens, God didn't give us what we ask. So we have to ask knowing that God's going to bless us, knowing that we're going to do his will with what he gives us. So let's review. I don't want my prayers to have bad reception. I need to be earnest in my prayers. I need to seek God's will, not my own will. And I need to pray believing. I need to ask knowing that God is going to give me what I wanted. I read a story that a preacher named Tony Evans, he lives down in Texas, was telling. He said that uh, he doesn't like elevators. He said there's just something about being in this little confined box, hundreds of feet above the air, being held up by a cable that he can't see that kind of gives him the heebie-jeebies. He's not very confident in it. He, he doesn't like being way up there and not being able to control anything because he's afraid something's going to go wrong. And one day it did. It was in this big office building, a crowded elevator, many, many stories above the ground, and it stopped. And it was stuck between floors. And people started panicking. Some of them dropped on the ground, started praying. Some of them started beating on the doors. Some of them started screaming for help. But nobody could hear them. He said one person calmly walked to the front of the elevator and opened the little panel and pulled out the telephone that was in there because he knew that there was somebody on the other end of that line that could do something, that would fix it. He said even if he whispered, he didn't have to yell, he didn't have to shout, he didn't have to panic, because he knew that there was somebody that would listen, that cared, and that would make things right. And he said, that's the power of prayer. He said, sometimes I'm gonna be in a situation that I don't like, and I'm not comfortable, and I'm scared, and I don't have any control over the situation, but I know somebody that does. And I know somebody that is listening and I know somebody that cares about me and wants to help me. The person that trusts in the power of prayer knows the Lord and he knows that he's listening to us when we reach out to him. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to doubt because we know that Jesus is standing before the Father as our intercessor. He's bringing our prayers to the Father's throne. We've got somebody on the other end of our prayers that's listening. We've got somebody that cares. We've got somebody that can do something about it if we'll just approach him in the right frame of mind. But if you want Jesus to relay your prayers to the Father, then you need to be a Christian. It's the only life worth living, the only death one would dare to die. If you're not a Christian, you can be denied. If you are a Christian, maybe your prayer life's been suffering. Maybe you haven't been approaching God in the way that you should. If you need to make some changes in your life tonight, don't you do it right now? As we stand together and as we sing.